Welcome back after the break. I hope you had a time to grab a cup of coffee. Uh, the next block is on DOA and international, and as this is for the DOA audience, you can imagine that we received plenty of questions uh, on these topics. And DOA covers not only the DOA update, but also the level of involvement and new privileges for DOA, or the remote test witnessing and remote auditing. And I'm quite happy that I have now Julian Hall with me, the head of the DOA and ETSO department, to answer the first question uh, in, in this domain. Hi, Julian. The first question comes from Salvatore from Logic, and it's not really directly related uh, to, to DOA, to a certain kind, yes. Is there any news regarding possible ETSOs to be included in the full DOA organization instead of ADOA. A couple of years ago this was announced, but it seems that things didn't went as far as announced at that stage. Good morning, Marcus, and uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, indeed, this was a, an issue in the past for applicants, uh, but I'm pleased to, to say that EASA has started to accept applications from DOAs, which include the scope of work related to ETSO based upon three different streams. Um, the first one is that we can merge an existing approval uh, ADOA holder for ETSO and a DOA held by the same country company under one unique DOA. And we can extend the scope of a DOA to ETSO based upon a significant change application. Also for new applications, new DOAs, if they have in their scope a minimum, a minor change related to the product, the aircraft or the engine, and ETSO. The difficulty is though, part 21 subpart J doesn't include any privilege related to ETSO. Uh, so the main advantage here is to have one approval under the DOA, which is related to the uh, efficiency increases by managing only one approval, and also the possibility to cover the equipment approval and the related installation at aircraft level without the need to involve um, a different organisation approval. And for future rulemaking tasks on PAR 21, we might foresee the additional development of the concept, but at the moment, they're not yet launched. They're not a priority at the moment. Thank you. Thanks for that update, Julian. Uh, the next question is from Stefan from Airbus. Uh, for the management of expert resources, how DOA holders can support EASA to determine the critical size of experts uh, per product line? Do you have specific plans or strategies for the coming retirements? So Stefan knows the age pyramid of EASA pretty well, I guess. Yes, and, and thanks for the question, Stefan. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. And um, the, uh, the assumption here is that this is relating to EASA staff and the EASA workforce. So that's how I've answered, uh, in turn, I'm answering this. And the first point is um, we always appreciate the feedback from the industry uh, in case there are certain touch points where there is a specific resource issue, maybe on a certain panel, etc. And we do consider that. However, you need to be aware as well that we do apply a strategic workforce management process within the agency for management of our workforce. And that comprises of a process with a regular review of the anticipated retirements. And we are subject to EU rules and procedures and regulations, as, as you may well know. And when a staff member retires, the agency reviews the current and anticipated workload uh, in the domain where the retiree was working, and then we assess the need whether we need to maintain that position or not, uh, or to use the same staffing level in that domain, or indeed increase it. And the intention is, is if the need is confirmed, there are various sourcing options that we would consider for replacing that post. We can, we can either outsource using our National Aviation Authority um, partners, we can use internal mobility between directorates, we can have development and mobility, or we can go for external recruitment. Now, depending on what is the best object, uh, uh, outcome for us, we will uh, pass that to EASA management, and the EASA management will make the most appropriate option to, to decide how we fill those positions. So I hope that answers the question for Stefan. Thanks, Julian. Another question from Stefan was on your presentation on the DOA optimization process. Uh, and it's related to the evolution of IT tools, and he's wondering whether DOA holders will be 
required to use these tools and what are the current plans? So in, indeed, no, there is uh, no intention that DOA holders uh, to, are to use these tools. The feedback that was provided on the DOA optimization was an internal review. And those IT tools that we're developing under the Stream 3 are only going to be applicable for um, our internal use. And it's a way of trying to ensure that the uh, duplicated platforms that we currently have and inconsistencies across database da databases holding the data that we have will be harmonized and make it much easier for our DOA inspectors internally and for the outsourced uh, National Aviation Authority uh, uh, surveyors to ensure that they have a, a better and more efficient uh, way of doing business internally. And we're hoping that these new tools uh, should be ready around 2023. So I hope that clears that for Stefan. Yeah, thanks. And I think it will take away one of the concerns for industry that another new tool needs to be uh, implemented. So that's quite well noted. Thanks. The next question on DOA is from Bragi from Aptos. And he's concerned about the more or less redundant double audit system that DOAs have. They have the internal system. Most companies hold also a POA or sometimes a maintenance organization approval. Uh, so you have several audits internally. Uh, and how could we make use more also of their uh, internal system monitoring, uh, independent system monitoring tools and results? Uh, any feedback on, on that? Yes, uh, and thanks, Braggy, for the question. Um, so the, there's a philosophy uh, behind the uh, organizational approval logic within the European Union system. And the logic is the fact that there are privileges associated with an organizational approval holder, be that in DOA, MOA, or POA, or any other domain. And as part of that approval privilege, the organization has to have an internal um, monitoring system. And that internal quality monitoring system is the organization's responsibility to ensure that they are meeting the intent of the rule and complying with all of the requirements and regulations in place. So there are some areas where there can be synergies between different domains, indeed. However, I do want to make it very clear that there is a, a completely different stream of activity from the regulatory authority. So if EASA is the competent authority for DOA or if it's a split competence where the member state may also be the competent authority, that independent review of the organizational approval system is a sampling check of how the system operates. And it is not uh, a redundant system. Sometimes it may be seen as duplicative uh, because the organization has already done the internal audit and it may then be sampled by the national authority or by the agency. So yes, I, I agree there can be some synergies across domains. Nevertheless, there is this uh, clear distinction between the organizational uh, uh, approval holders' responsibilities for an internal quality monitoring system and the role of the authority in auditing that on a sample basis. So I hope that clears the, the logic between the, the, the two uh, approaches. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Uh, the next question, you can see that people really read and watch your presentation. Um, it's why Spanish DOAs do not appear on the map on slide eight of your presentation. Okay, thanks for that. And I do remember discussing this with you, Marcus, and you did warn me that the, the, the data hadn't transferred correctly and uh, it was an error in the presentation graphic. So there's, uh, it was just purely a mistake on our side on transferring the data onto the slide. Uh, and there are obviously uh, DOAs in Spain. And to clarify, there are 24 approved DOAs in Spain. And another of the other <coughs> countries who may feel aggrieved because they weren't shown there, um, include Germany with 81 DOAs, that's the highest number per uh, country, and we have the Czech Republic with 18 and Switzerland with 15. So thanks for picking that up. Yes, that was an error on our side and uh, clearly the numbers are there. And I just want to highlight as well, that data is also available on the EASA website, uh, regularly updated where we maintain lists of all the DOAs. Thanks. Thanks, Julian. Then a question from our Swiss colleagues, Bastian from Jet Aviation. For Switzerland, the 
SMS law and regulation will be implemented uh, by national law, which might be delayed because of the different uh, legal system from the EU law. So how would that be effective then for Swiss DOAs, the SMS rule? Okay, thanks for this question. It's, it's, it's something that we experience um, on quite a regular basis across the various domains uh, because the, uh, the Swiss have an association agreement with the European Union on, on, on the bilateral, so there is a timing difference in implementation, as you rightly highlight. Now, to, to, to try and alleviate this lag, this time lag, EASA may consider accepting the application for significant change uh, for the SMS, even if the rule is not applicable yet in Switzerland. Now, if the organization is ready to implement the SMS, uh, the future SMS requirements, one, they're applicable in the EU, but not yet in Switzerland, EASA once again may agree to start to review uh, the SMS uh, application early. And we may even improve the procedures to comply with an SMS before the rule is applicable in Switzerland, as long as those procedures do not conflict with the requirements applicable before SMS introduction i.e. those are still applicable to the Swiss organization. So it's trying to get a pragmatic way of closing this gap and allow, allowing you to stay aligned with the timing. Um, and regarding the possible extension of deadlines, uh, so that's not really up to the agency. Once the SMS requirements are adopted in the Swiss law, the applicability and transition provisions will provided, uh, be provided and defined there in the Swiss law itself. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Julian. The next one is from Solutions for Aviation, and it's about the coordination between DOAs, POAs, Part 145 uh, organizations. Again, it's similar to what we discussed earlier. Is there any possibility to streamline the process in the near future? Uh, even though there are different organizations, they need, for example, between DOA and POA uh, an arrangement signed or an agreement. Um, both organizations are approved, so what is the need to check each other's procedure? So, this is, this is a very valid comment, and um, one of the points we've found in the past is that uh, with the DOA, POA and 145 in particular, they, they have a lot of commonality, but they have also have some differences which could have been aligned. Unfortunately, one of the difficulties we have is that these were legacy rules and we did try and um, align in many ways uh, a lot of the, the rules and, uh, and uh, processes within the different codes. And we are, of course, in favor of standardizing wherever possible. Now, at the moment, as, as you are aware with the rulemaking plan, there is a challenge to get a prioritization of rulemaking tasks. And for this specific question at the moment, we do not have any changes envisaged in the short term to align at the rule level. So yes, we do understand there are some differences. We do try and align. And sometimes that is difficult to get through in even in the time of consultation of the MPA, uh, which we've experienced in the past. Um, one thing I would like to probably clarify is just at the bottom of this uh, question you had mentioned, the fact that uh, uh, one of the examples was a part 145 being able to manufacture some parts, but they don't have the same requirement as the POAs. Um, I just want to clarify that one. That's a specific case. And in that specific case, uh, a 145 cannot uh, manufacture parts. What they can do is fabricate items uh, as part of their ongoing maintenance tasks. So that is slightly different. They are different privileges between the POA and the MOA in that case. And that one wouldn't be necessarily something that is going to be changed in the near future. So I hope that gives a bit of clarification on that. Yeah, thanks, Julian, for that exhaustive uh, explanation. Another question from Solutions for Aviation is, again, to your uh, streamlining process, the restructuring of the departments, do you expect optimization in response times on projects so that we are more efficient in handling initial application surveillance activities? Um, and what industry is seeing more and more that it causes delays to get responses from, from colleagues? Yes, and is it, it, this, is a, this is another good question. And it's, it's one of the challenges we experience and that the industry experiences. 
Um, and clearly, one of the planned benefits of the optimization of resources in EASA would be the more efficient planning uh, of resources at project level. Now, what we do need to do is assess that and look at the feedback over a period of time to see how that uh, how that develops and how it works. But I would like to also say that this is a, um, a, a it's a partnership as well. Uh, we also would would like to work with the industry to make sure that we can prioritise projects which are of the highest uh, priority for industry. So it's there's a level of prioritisation that needs to be done on both sides, both at the agency level and at the um, organization level to, uh, to assist us to get to the end result of, 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 of putting our resources in the most critical projects at the right time. But like I said, we'll assess that over, over a period of time now that the changes are in pl place and see if we're getting the results that we had planned. So I, I hope that gives a, a, a broad brush answer to that, Marcus. Yeah, thanks, Julian. And uh, now we come to the Slido questions. And one is linked again to SMS and the monitoring. Uh, is it expected that DOAs, POAs, MA, MOAs uh, do the audits on their own or are there specific SMS audits planned? Um, I don't know whether that's for you or for Rodrigo, but I think uh, because it's for DOA audits, it's something that you might be able to answer, Julian. Okay, thanks, thanks for the question. So uh, I think it is one of those SMS at the moment as it's being rolled out is not being rolled out horizontally at the same time across all regulations. So DOA, POA and MOA introduction of SMS is not on the same timeline. So what will happen is that the uh, SMS audit and implementation of, of SMS will take place as part of the regular oversight of those individual codes, whether it's 21 subpart J for DOA, part 145, etc. So that I think would be the way we would do it. And what we are obviously trying to do is, is train our uh, team leaders um, in line with the AMC and the rules when they're stabilized so that they'll be in a position to have a standardized approach on how they do that oversight along with our national authority partners. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Uh, another question from, uh, is SMS required for non-TC holder DOAs? So STC holders, for example. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Well, we have one question uh, on the DOA performance, uh, and it, it reflects the past events from other experts, DOA team leaders, so the dashboard that we have, um, but also the independent system monitoring uh, evaluation. Um, why are the ISM products not mentioned in the AMC guidance material as a relevant input for the formation of that DOA score? So how we establish the, the dashboard more or less to make more use of the ISM uh, information from the DOA? So uh, th there are two, two aspects to, to, to this. Well, internally within the agency, we look at the, the feedback that comes from the de design organization approval team leader. And we also look at the impact that comes from the product certification uh, PCMs and the experts. And there's an algorithm that we put together to try and um, assess how that uh, final input comes for the overall performance of the DOA. So the ISM system is part of the internal monitoring of the organization. And if, if there are issues associated with the ISM, that will be de facto included in, in, the, in the dashboard, but it's not directly from the ISM of the organization. It's, it's more of a, an, a, a, a joint uh, assessment between the PCM, uh, the experts, and the DOA team leaders for the organization. Okay, thanks for that clarification. And I think with that, we covered the DOA aspects. The next topic is level of involvement and future privileges. And I would like to welcome Ralph Bader, now for answering the, the question that we received on this. Ralph, are you with us? Yeah, hello. Uh, good morning, I'm with you, yes. So the first question comes from Flores from Fokker Technique. Uh, it's about the assessment of DOAs about their planning and the schedule and the problem that 
if the schedule is impacted, for example, by availability of EASA colleagues, uh, how that impacts their performance assessment and the LOI rating. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the feedback takes into account clearly the applicant's performance. So a delay, if it should be created by a late EASA response, is not to be considered in the performance feedback. The, the target for a detailed EASA response, uh, that means other than an administrative feedback um, about when a detailed answer will be provided is five weeks. This, however, depends on the targeted review. So it is clear if for a huge project an enormous amount of, of retained compliance data is provided at the end of the project, for example, or uh, the review might be need then more time, clearly, especially if there are several of such projects running in parallel. So um, even if we really try to provide a feedback in, in this targeted five weeks, please take this into account for your planning um, that this is done in an appropriate way. Uh, and clearly, it, it's the applicant's performance. If EASA performs with a longer time period, um, this shall not be taken into account in the performance feedback. And uh, all the experts and PCMs are trained on this aspect. Thanks, Ralph, for that clarification. Another question from Ian from the Independent Aircraft Modifier Alliance is again related to the LOI. And it's acknowledged that LOI should prevent uh, late changes in involvement levels and therefore be good not to have any delays. But nevertheless, uh, experience shows that some panel experts might come up with things uh, rather late, which then have impact on the project planning. And how can we both together ensure that these delays are reduced to the absolute minimum? Okay, th thanks for this feedback. Um, again, all EASA experts and PCMs are trained to provide the feedback to a certification program first after sufficient formalization, but then really at the beginning of the project. If feedbacks to the certification programs are not provided in a timely manner, please provide the related concerns to the PCM and uh, as a next step to, to the section manager of the product line. Uh, if there is maybe a really a point of resources or whatever, we have to solve this, um, but address it in, in this way first to the PCM and then to the section manager, and then we have to find a solution. Thanks, Ralph, for that. And then we have a number of questions on the new privileges for DOAs, which were introduced last year. And uh, I would like now to talk to Rob Bursma, who is the senior expert for, for this topic, senior DOA team leader for this topic. Rob, are you with us? Hi, Rob. Morning. Good morning, Marcus. Good morning. Yes, I'm here. Well, the first question, actually two questions from Roberto from Piaggio. Uh, the needed DOA performance evaluation shall be made timely available. What does that really mean, timely available? Well, it means directly after after the project has been closed. So in this case, in this context uh, related to, to the new privileges, uh, a reference project has been applied for by the DOA applicant. And uh, immediately after the project has been approved, all of the data is available uh, to the organization so they can uh, update our justification document and underpin the request for our 40 privilege. The next question is a bit longer. It's part 21 airplanes and frequent design changes that should be classified as major by the AMC and guidance material 91. Uh, for example, Comnaf antennas installations. Um, the additional requirements, the update for this um, would that be possible to have that kind of change classified under the new privilege under certain major changes or certain STCs? Well, Roberto uh, touches on a couple of topics like LPV, ADSB out, and other other um, uh, optional installations to the aircraft. So they, they look like proper candidates, but it's difficult to say in general. That's why we have the AMC material, and uh, and it takes you through the details of a project and tries to establish whether such a project is eligible for the privilege. This is what the organization shows through the justification document. But things that are important are, are for instance, uh, a low or very low uh, risk for each CDI of the project, good DOA performance, 
and there's a couple of exceptions in the AMC. Of course, those cannot be touched. Uh, ultimately, uh, as I said, they, they will be written down by the organization in the justification document for our agreement. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the, the listed <coughs> topics uh, look like good candidates. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Then we got a question from Bastian from Jet Aviation, actually four questions. The first one is about uh, 21A263, uh, major changes to those STCs. Would it be allowed for a DOA to approve major changes to STC that were previously approved by the agency? Yes, we do not exclude these cases. So, so it can be done. Uh, you can have a major change done on the privilege to an STC that was previously approved by the agency. Uh, as in all cases, so for those cases, but also cases that come later, where, where you do have an STC that was generated under privilege, obviously um, the, the EASA STC certificate cannot be updated. Uh, it's, it's, it lives by itself as a major change to the STC through a separate uh, self-generated certificate by the organization. Okay, thanks for the clarification. And then uh, he experienced at least with one non-European uh, authority that they would not accept uh, DOA-approved STCs. Do you have any experience so far with other NAAs not accepting this? Because it's a new concept. Oh. Yeah, it's definitely a new concept and uh, we've interfaced with our bilateral partners, but we, we have limited direct experience. Uh, we, we're just starting to build up the experience within the EU itself on, on how, this, how this privilege is implemented. Um, what, what is important to note, and, and this is what we also uh, use in our discussions with uh, within validations that we do review some of the data before we interact with the foreign authority. So even though an STC, for instance, may have been approved under privilege, we would look at the data before we send it on to our uh, validation partners. And then a more practical question, how would the DOA with approval privilege be notified of new non-generic CRE or special conditions that they would be normally uh, raised at the kickoff meeting where they may be not evolved. Rob, you're still there? Oh, have we lost him? Oh. We'll see if we can get him back. Hopefully. Audio issues. Oh, can you still hear me? Yes, we can yeah. still hear you. Rob, can you answer the question? Oh, it looks like it sounds like we have a connection problem there. Okay, then we come back to to him maybe a little later. Um, the other top. Ah, ah, Rob, Excellent. you're back. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, don't know exactly what happened there, but uh, I just uh, experienced a brief internet uh, problem. Okay, I will read out the question again. Uh, DOAs with these approval yeah, privileges. Um, how would they be notified of, non -new, uh, of new non-generic crease or special conditions as they would be raised normally during the kickoff meeting with EASA? So how would they make aware of this? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, they wouldn't, <laughs> actually. Um, the, the, the privilege is based such that uh, on the fact that the projects are basically always the same. The application may be different, different aircraft type, different aircraft model, but the the project is always always the same, and therefore the certification of that project is always the same. So would the project uh, application on a new aircraft type, for instance, need a, a CRE or, or there's a special, special case to be considered? It actually would fall outside of the privilege and needs to be applied for again to EASA. So the case should not occur as such. Okay, thanks for the clarification. The last part of the questions is, can you clarify the requirements for low, very low likelihood only, and why didn't we include the severity? For example, why didn't we go for risk class one or two? Well, we considered that uh, the likelihood of an unidentified non-compliant. Oops. Okay, then I think we should go to the next topic. Uh, which is remote test witnessing and remote auditing. Uh, we have Michele Ambrosio, uh, who was heavily involved in the establishment of the third memo and who did the, the video that you could all watch. Michele, are you online and available? 
Yes, Good morning, perfect. Mark. Yes. Good morning, Michele. Uh, first question on you, remote te test witnessing. There was a requirement for the retention period of the test videos uh, from the FAA. Is this the same with EASA? Do we have our own? And how long is it the video needs to be retained? Yes, uh, so th thank you for, for the question, Marcus and, and Soma. Um, indeed, the, the FAA policy statement and our certification memorandum are very well aligned on this point. So if we read the, the cert memo in, in its paragraph three, uh, there is a specific bullet point which is called uh, need for uh, the retention of the audio, video, or other information. And uh, it says that YASA may request that the person conducting the inspection uh, or test record and save video, audio, or other information for a specified time to enable uh, post-test evaluation. So. Uh, this means that YASA does not have a specified uh, time period prescribed for the for the recording of the session to be retained, but uh, but it's, it will have to be agreed on a case by case basis with the with the YASA team, also as as part of the procedures developed by the by the design organization. Okay, thanks for that, Michele. Another one on test witnessing. Uh, why? Are we using only test complexity or non-complex to trigger the witnessing? How do you define the complexity? And test complexity does not generate systematic need for test witnessing. That's from Stefan from Airbus. Yes, exactly. It's, it's a very good question. I think uh, here it's, it's important not to confuse the, the LOI concept uh, with the eligibility of a test or inspection to, to remote witnessing, which are uh, different things. So when assessing a CDI of a project, the applicants uh, should assess the risk of an, uh, of an unidentified non-compliance against mm, the known criteria that are uh, novelty, complexity, uh, criticality, and your performance. And this leads to a risk class allocation. So, so this is the first step to be done regardless of remote witnessing. It's, it always has to be done. And once the risk class is determined and the need uh, uh, of YASA witnessing is identified and, uh, and agreed with the, with the YASA team, then the applicant should use the guidelines in the cert memo to determine if remote witnessing can be applicable. So this is a second step. And the criteria to make this determination are not uh, only limited to complexity, they, they also include uh, the level of competence of, of the personnel in the use of specific equipment, uh, appropriateness of in instruments, uh, need for specific testing devices, and, and, ma and many others. So also in paragraph 4.4, we provide a list of example, examples that are hardly subject to, a, to an adequate evaluation through, through remote witnessing. So I hope that with this um, explanation, I clarifies the subject of, of when and, and how we as is involved in, in remote witnessing. Thanks a lot, Michele. Uh, then we have a question also from Stefan from Airbus, but this time on remote auditing. And I would like to welcome Claudio Caruso uh, from the DOA team to answer to that question. Good morning and thanks for the question, Marcus. Actually, we are still learning from the implementation, so the policy is not fully mature for sharing. But uh, should you have any question, please uh, just contact me. Well, you're too fast, Claudio. I didn't even read the question <laughs> yet. <laughs> but that's uh, exactly this, the question was about sharing the DOA internal policy with industry, how we perform remote auditing. And, and as Claudio said, uh, it's an internal policy and we are not going to share it at this time. But we might discuss with industry uh, how this can be eventually done in the future. Also, we need to gain some experience first. Yeah, as we have lost Rob a bit, maybe we can come at the end, uh, come back to a few questions. Uh, also in the Slido that Rob uh, would be able to answer, like the first one, can we use generic STCs of other DOAs on our projects? It's currently the most popular question. I hope when we have Rob back later on uh, that we can address that, that question. Should we go to the international part then? Do you yes, want to move on and to that bit? because as part of this overall block, we also had the questions on 
international policies, bilateral partners, and I will hand over to, to John on the questions on this. Thanks, Marcus. And one thing just to say, I know we've, we've had a couple of questions further down the Slido uh, about peop from people particularly who hasn't, haven't seen the videos and were asking where they were. So if you didn't, haven't seen the videos already, don't go and watch them now because there's too much happening here uh, and too many interesting things. But uh, if you go to the event webpage for this workshop, on the ASA event page and if you come back to it you're looking tomorrow after the event's over you have to click on the past events and then you'll find it there and then on that page is a link to the dedicated website and there's a whole bunch of all the different expert videos that you can re-watch so if you didn't see them already that's where you can find those. Uh, so now we're going to talk about some of the international activities and we had some questions on that that my colleagues Gregory and Charles are going to answer. Um, and the first question actually is for Gregory. Uh, Gregory, are you there? Yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Hi, Gregory. Uh, so the first question from Case at Sla Safran asks, uh, the IASA uh, JCAB tip still shows draft when opened via the IASA website uh, and certain sections still show to be developed. I know this is somewhat of a technical problem, so maybe you can explain a bit about that one. Yeah, thank you, John. So indeed, there were some technical issues with some browsers. It's really a, a, an IT uh, aspect. Uh, and, and we noticed uh, this um, as well within EASA. So uh, what, what you can do if you experience these difficulties is just to erase your browser's uh, history. Uh, and, and normally, when you go back to EASA's web page, you have the latest version of the tip. Because indeed, the current version, which is published on our website does not uh, comprise this uh, draft mentioned anymore. So um, in principle, you, you should not have that old version. Our, our IT uh, department is working on, on a more permanent fix, but what I could advise to um, our participants is, is to try this trick uh, to, to have access to the, to the right version of the tip. Maybe I can say another word about the, the content. So, so just to remind that uh, a specificity about the um, Bazaar with Japan was that it uh, had a provision for a provisional implementation as of the date of its signature. So it entered into force in June last year, uh, faster than normal bazaars because it entered into force before the ratification process was, was completed. So this explains why uh, at the time we focused on developing the most substantial portions of the TIP, such as uh, validation processes, change classification, uh, application processes, data packages, continuing our worthiness, and so on. Uh, but it's true that in the current version, although it's not a draft anymore, th there are still some uh, portions which are to be developed. Uh, and these are on topics which we thought were um, less critical, such as surrender of certificates or technical support among authorities. So um, we, we know that this needs to be done. Um, in, in consultation with our stakeholders in the past few months, um, other international priorities were given uh, more focus. And as you know, our resources are limited. Uh, however, in uh, 2022, we, we intend to approach GCAP to complete those portions which are not yet uh, finalized. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Gregory. And we've got another question now from Ian Devine uh, from the Independent Aircraft Modifier Alliance who asks about the Chinese BASA and the TIP. Um, is in your video, you are, he asks, is the intent of the ongoing discussion to allow EASA design organization approval holders established in China prior to the bilateral be allowed to keep their approval or will this get revoked? Thank you. That's a very good question indeed. Um, and this probably refers to some provisions of the annex and the TIP. So for, for those who are interested, uh, for production organization, you have some developments on this topic in uh, paragraphs 452, 455, and 456. And you also have some developments on all organizations in the TIP in paragraph 1.3, uh, subparagraph 5. So I will not enter into more details now. Uh, this is a topic which is on the agenda of CAC and EASA. It's been discussed in uh, every one of the three COP meetings which we already held. And uh, each organization is in a different situation. So we have started to discuss with CAC, but really on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, 
The main message that I could uh, pass in, in answering that question is that anyway, um, if a termination of, of the uh, approval is foreseen, there would be consultation with the uh, approval holder. So if that's the case uh, for your organization, uh, do not worry for now. When the discussions with CAC have, have matured and progressed, we will approach you and, and we will discuss uh, the, the next steps with, with you. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Gregory. And actually, there's a, Ian then has a, a, an additional question. So uh, in terms of the, the post-validations lesson le lessons learned that takes place between authorities, he says um, in the video that post-approval lessons learned, the review group between EASA and the FAA, and then also the review of validation projects between EASA and TCCA, um, uh, and he's offering that he's, Ian's part of this independent aircraft modifier alliance. Um, he's offering to contribute to the lessons learned by submitting feedback uh, from the, the applicant's point of view. Uh, and he asks, uh, can, we, can we say how these could be submitted and how would they submit those questions? Uh, and then just as a follow up to that, um, regarding the successful industry involvement in the CMT annual meeting, um, also, can you let him know how uh, uh, his organisation con con can contribute to the 2022 uh, annual meeting? Thanks. Uh, thank you, John. That, that's a very re relevant question. I would like to thank uh, IMA for, for the support uh, offered. So, yes, indeed, we would welcome their contribution. So, the, the most natural channel is to go through the PCM who's been in charge of, of the support of the validation with a, a foreign partner. And then the, the, we, we have um, a process in place, a network, where the PCM reports to the senior PCM validation and ultimately to my colleague uh, Charles, who's the chief PCM validation. So, so that's one, one way to provide feedback. If it's more structural and not related to a specific project, um, then um, my team uh, can collect that uh, input. And, and discuss that with Charles. So what, what I suggest is that uh, I, I will, uh, in this particular case, I will approach IAMA and provide the names and contact details of the um, certification policy officers who can collect that feedback. Um, regarding the second question, we already held uh, an informal contact uh, with, with Gamma, which is coordinating the um, industry uh, input to the CMT week. Uh, and the feedback we got was positive. IMA would be welcome to contribute. So there again, uh, if you allow me, we, we will go back to, directly to IMA with some more details about how they can channel their contribution. But in principle, they would be welcome to participate in the 2022 uh, edition of the CMT uh, industry week as well. Fantastic, thanks. And there's one more question then um, where Ihan from THY Technic asks, uh, is there any update regarding the major scope extension for non-EU design organisations? Uh, and in addition to this, what are the acceptance criteria for the application? Yeah, thank you. That's um, not an easy question. Um, it's pretty much done case by case. So... In the EU regulatory framework, we have some provisions allowing for the issuance of DOA or POA to non-EU organizations. Uh, however, uh, the default option is to follow ICAO Annex 8 state of design, state of registry logic and to rely uh, on the state of design. So this, this is why the EU has concluded a number of BASA with partner states and EASA has concluded a number of working arrangements with the partner authorities. Uh, but each of these instruments is different, uh, and that's why it's difficult to provide a blanket uh, answer. Um, and in some cases in the past, indeed, some DOA and POA with different scopes were issued uh, outside of the EU. This is absolutely uh, possible. So, so as every state has a different institutional framework guiding its relation with the EU, um, what I suggest is that if... Um, you, you are a, a non-EU organization uh, and you're interested in, in, in receiving uh, an EASA approval, that you approach us and, and we will review your particular case um, in the light of the uh, current framework with your state of design. Uh, and that's what I would uh, recommend that um, the, the, the gentleman who was that question could do. We can approach uh, him directly and, and continue the discussion on the specificities of his case. 
Fantastic. Thanks for that, Gregory. And um, we've got a couple more questions then, or three more questions on the international side for our colleague Charles LaBeouf. So, uh, Charles, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. Hi. Good, to see, good to see you. Um, so, for the first question, we have a question from Dagmar at Lufthansa Technic uh, about the mutual acceptance of non-significant changes. Uh, he says it's not clear yet how an operator uh, and its authority may identify the classification of an EASA change or SC, STC as significant or non-significant. Could you inform a little bit about the further steps planned by EASA? Yes, thank you, Dagmar, for raising that point. Well, firstly, the mutual acceptance of non-significant non changes depends on the terms of the bilateral agreements that we've agreed with our bilateral partners. Uh, a non-significant change will be, for instance, accepted in Japan by the GCAB, uh, whereas it may require a validation with FA, for instance, if it triggers one of the non-basic uh, classification criteria. Uh, more generally, it's up to the design approval holder to keep a clear status of its ESL-approved design uh, to justify that at the time of export of a product, the proposed configuration is either accepted or has been validated by the uh, importing uh, party. Concerning more specifically the uh, significant or non-significant classification, uh, our tips contain clear indications that the classification established by the primary certificating authority, in that case EASA, is accepted by the VA. And the significant and non-significant classification is part of the certification plan that is covered by the uh, EASA approval. Uh, so I hope that uh, with that it, it clarifies a bit the, uh, the, the question. But in case of any encounter difficulty, please do not hesitate to, to ask support to uh, your ears at PCM. We'll be pleased to support you and, uh, if necessary, liaise directly with, our, uh, with the foreign authorities to, to bring any necessary clarification. Fantastic. Thanks, Charles. Uh, that was really clear. So uh, the next question we have from Case again at Safran uh, is about the, uh, the JCAB tip. He says there's no reference to EPA requirements currently. Uh, as a result, they find their Japanese clients uh, find it difficult to accept non-ETSO aftermarket furniture, seat furniture parts. Uh, will the tip be revised with guidance and if so, when? Well, thank you for raising uh, this one. EPA marking is an interesting topic. Uh, usually, the tips provide marking requirements for import. Uh, you've got some, some bazaar and tips uh, that indicate that there is a direct and full recognition of the marking systems of the other party. That's the case uh, for the, the tip with Transport Canada, ANAC, and the UKCA to a lesser extent. Uh, the other tips stipulate which are the requirements for identification and marking of the imported products. And that's typically the case of the, the tip we have with JCAB. The identification and marking requirements are indicated, namely in the paragraph 5.4 of the tip. And what it says is that for import of a product to EU, the product shall be identified in accordance with our part 21 subpart Q, including the EPA marking in that case. But that's for products that are going to be imported to Europe. And for the import to Japan, so specifically in that case, the product should be identified in accordance with uh, three requirements. The first one is the uh, CAR, the Civil Aviation Rules, Article 141. Well, that's for the uh, aircraft identification plate. Uh, the GCAP Circular 1004, Article 7, which specifies which are the requirements for the markings of appliances. And here you find uh, a lot of similarities with our requirements of the uh, Part 21 subpart Q. And finally, uh, the tip quotes the JCAB Circular 1008. That's in case of uh, import of, uh, of products, appliances uh, for emergency exit safety equipment, etc. That deserve specific markings uh, to enter the Japanese market. So, provided a part uh, to be exported to Japan complies with the identification and markings required by Japan as per the tip in, uh, in paragraph 5.4, there is no issue if it carries also the European marking, and namely the EPA marking. Um, so maybe it's also an opportunity to, to, to make it clear that the EPA marking uh, is just a marking. That's not an approval. So it's very different to the PMA parts uh, that you may have with the, with the U.S. systems. There are no such EPA parts. EPA is just a marking, and maybe that's a point that should be uh, made clearer sometimes to, 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 our, uh, to our Japanese partner. Um, here again, uh, in case of difficulty to get that explanation accepted by uh, GCAP staff, Please refer to your ears at PCM. Uh, we're here to support you. 
and we've got good relation with our uh, JCAB uh, partners and uh, we'll coordinate uh, and, and contact them directly to make sure that they, they, they accept this explanation. Fantastic. Thanks for that answer, Charles. And there's one more question then for you from Ian in Divine again um, about the EU-UK BASA and TIP. Uh, and in the video, uh, it outlines the automatic acceptance being valid for non-significant changes to the TC, including the STC. Um, when does EASA foresee similar approaches under the FAA EASA bilateral agreement? For example, starting perhaps with basic STCs. Um, he says this would enable a level playing field in the aftermarket uh, where currently changes designed by the airframe OEM uh, follow an easier and, and quicker validation path. Well, thank you here again. That, that, uh, that's a very uh, relevant point. Uh, well, contrary to, the, to, some, to some agreements like the EU-UK agreement or even the EU-Japan uh, BASA and TIP, all the other TIPs, including the TIP with, uh, with the FA, make a distinction in the validation path that is followed uh, for the approval of changes if they are brought by the TC holder or the STC holder or if the same changes are brought by a third person under an STC. Which means that, uh, as explained in, in a question, uh, uh, a non-significant change, for instance, uh, developed by a TC holder may be, under conditions, uh, be accepted by the FA if it does not trigger any other non-basic classification uh, criteria, whereas the exact same change that would be developed by a third person under an STC would anyhow undergo a validation. Well, coming to the point of the level playing field, uh, the changes brought by the TIP revision 6 with the FA uh, align the criteria for classification basic, non-basic, between the changes of the TC and STC holders and the changes uh, brought by a third person. Previously, you had a, a set of criteria to classify major changes level one, level two, coming from the TC holders, and you had another set of criteria for basic, non-basic. With a TIP revision six, this is the same, uh, this is the same uh, set of criteria bringing some kind of uh, level playing field uh, in both cases. Furthermore, uh, the TIP Revision 6 also introduced some time frame, 15 working days um, generally, for the validation of uh, basic uh, changes which are submitted to validation, so typically basic STCs. But apart from that, uh, there is no plan so far in the short or mid-term to evolve towards an automatic acceptance of basic STCs between EASA and the FA. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that uh, really comprehensive answer. Now, Marcus, are we going to go back to Rob or do you want to uh, move on? No, to I think we should move on. We should try to see whether Rob is back on stage uh, maybe after we went through the other yeah, topics. To yeah. Also, then we can maybe address some of the slider questions which are for Rob mm. or others. Sounds like a good plan. So, hopefully you found that section of the uh, uh, of the agenda really useful and interesting as, as we say we try and come back to Rob's uh, other questions and uh, other ones that we have in the Slido a little bit later on in the agenda. So we're going to move on now to the next part which is to look at the military activities. So we're going to move to that very shortly. So it's John now. So for this next part of the agenda, as I say, we're going to be talking about military activities. Now, from my side, you know, in a former life before joining the ERSA, I was uh, in, in the Air Force involved for 20 years in military activities. So it's an area you know, I've been involved in quite a lot at EASA here. Uh, and obviously, you know, I know some people are always interested about the military, the relationship between EASA and military activities, and we do quite often get a lot of questions on that. And who better to do a presentation on that than our chief engineer, Alan Lawal? You've, you know, you've been looking, you, you've, you've been here at EASA, covered so many topics, technically in so much detail. So yeah, it'd be great to hear what you have to say on this topic, Alan. Uh, thank you, John. Too kind, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you may wonder why do we talk today about military product here, John? Uh, we are a civil uh, authority, and in fact, we are involved from day one in military business. Whether we like it or not, we have no choice. So we have to make sure that we can find the right synergies to make sure that the two worlds can really 
coordinate and work for the interest of the safety. We are a safety agency and safety has no border, whether it is civil or military, we have to make sure that we discharge our responsibility properly. So let's walk through what I will tell you today. Uh, it's a bit late in the day, but I think I will try to surprise you with a few things here and maybe confuse you. Sorry in advance if I confuse you. We have been confused for quite a few years, so I would understand if some of you have difficulties to follow, but I'm sure we will find a way to answer your, uh, your questions and solve any grey area you may have. So just to let you know, in the agency, you may or may not know, but we have a military advisor working directly with Patrick Key together with me. And of course, all what I say here has been coordinated with our military advisor, Monsieur Don Nicole, former general from the French Air Force. So, in a nutshell, what will we walk through? And I insist, it is a walkthrough. It is a very high-level presentation. I think it's the first time, Marcus, huh, we are talking about military into this kind of uh, event. So, I apologize in advance if it is too high-level or sometimes too focused. We will make sure that any question will be taken care of later on. So. To start with, what are the ongoing actions? I will focus on a couple of actions only. There are many more, as you can imagine, but I want to highlight two, maybe three, key actions which are conditional to any business in between the military and the uh, civil uh, safety authorities. Then we walk through four scenarios we have identified, through four different scenarios to certification of a civil type gradually going to the military environment. So that's already a challenge for the established civil uh, DOA, TC holder and so forth. Then I will just show you, and you may be surprised by the number of hidden expertise we have in the agency. A lot of valuable expertise which may be used not only for civil certification but also for military or state aircraft uh, purpose. And then start the real life. Coordinatedness, maintenance, and how to work with the operators, that means the air forces in general, and the manufacturers through various civil or military DOA. And that's why you see the link with today's presentation. The DOA is crucial to our business for IASA. It is even more crucial for the military business because we have a civil DOA and we have a military DOA. And the two together have really to, to work in very good harmony. So, let's go through the first actions. Basically, we have to clarify, it may look very simple, what is the scope of the certification of a civil and a military product. It may look very simple. It is the most complex question we have to answer. What do we mean when we enter into a certification of what we call a dual-use program? I will elaborate further in the next slides on this, and you will see that it becomes very quickly a bit complicated, and we may we may be challenged in our in our framework, in fact, into our regulatory framework, how to make it happen. A quick uh, a quick uh, a quick few words on ITAR and export control. The agency is working very hard on export control. We have a process in place. This process is really working since a year now, and for ITAR, bon, it is a bit more complicated because here we enter into the, the bulk of the classified and military information. It is work under construction, I have to be honest here. And then, very important, all what I say means it is not only certification, uh, John, it is agency-wide. It is certification, but it is also flight standard for all operational and maintenance aspects. So. That's where the confusion may start, and if it starts, I apologize in advance. What are we talking about when we speak about military and civil certification? This triangle you see here is the aircraft, the actual aircraft flying, operated in the Air Forces. And then you see two boxes. If you are colorblind, apologies in advance. You see a green, dark green box and a blue box, both in uh, dotted lines. The green one is the military end product certified by the military airworthiness authorities. Very important. This green aircraft operated is certified by an airworthiness authority of a given country. There is no European single TC as well for civil. So you will have as many civil, sorry, as many military TC as countries which have been customer for a given product. The blue dotted line you see here, the box, is our civil TC. This one is the European baseline. That's what IASA is able to certify. That means you take a civil standard, 
let's say a green aircraft, if we make a comparison with a standard uh, airline operation, and this blue box is our CIASA TAP certificate. This will be the basis, the foundation, on which the military authorities, all authorities with a S, very important, will establish their additional military equipment, mission equipment, that they will certify by themselves. And that's where you see the ambiguity. We have a civil TC as per ICAO, with responsibilities as a civil regulator, in particular for occurrence reporting and safe condition management and so forth. And on top of this civil TC, you have to recertify or to certify, to certify in addition some specific military equipment. And here we will not be involved. So what we try to do, and that's what we have to do with each single customer country, not with one, with all, we try to raise the bar. If IASA is able to certify more of the definition, the oversight in real life will be easier, and vice versa. So, if you look at the banner on the right-hand side, we have a very simple credo. An aircraft for dual use, state aircraft or military, has to be as civil as possible. That means we raise the bar as much as we can, but also as military as necessary. We will never certify missiles, or we will never certify the operation of refueling. But we may do something before, and that's where we have to focus, and together with the authorities, military, to work on the dotted line, the dark one, and the blue one, this package here, which is the military equipment taken care of by the agency. And if we are good at doing so, the higher the blue line is, the easier the process will be. But from this slide, I'm pretty sure you see that there is a need for real hand-to-hand -hand coordination. If not, no chance. Now, that's a big lesson from the past. And I, having been on both sides of the fence myself, yeah, it's, it, I, that balance, I yeah. think, works really, really well as well. Uh, you will see later, uh, this looks simple, this looks easy. We have an aircraft, we have a civil TC, we try to raise the bar as much as we can, but then we have to know how to transfer this TC to the military environment. And that's where the need, as we said below, is to coordinate with the military, sorry, you have an acronym here, I didn't mention what it means, the Military National Airworthiness Authorities. So we will have to coordinate with each of them how to transfer the ACI from our TC to their system on which basis they can build their final TC. So a, a bit complex and it needs very solid, very strong coordination between the various safety regulators. So now how to certify a dual use or state uh, registered aircraft. Basically we have four scenarios. If you start from the beginning, that's again uh, how to build a system. Uh, the first scenario is the most challenging one, the most difficult. We certify an aircraft which is designed only for military purpose and operation. This is extremely difficult because our part of the computer craft will be, as you see on the screen here, will be very limited. And therefore, the military influence will be very strong. So that's the first case. We certify a baseline aircraft which is a very little part of the complete product itself in the end. Then we move to different scenarios, a bit more comfortable. The typical one is uh, the large transport dual-use platform. And it is no coincidence here if I put a tanker. We have the case of the MRTT. The MRTT is a standard 330 on which we have added as much as we could civil modifications to the extreme. The boom is civil certified, many things are civil certified. And then the military part is a bit smaller. So easier to, easier to manage and easier to, to end over for the safety oversight in real life. Then you have a third scenario based on experience, I think decades of experience in the rotorcraft world. They were used from day one to do civil, military operation, police operation, to do state uh, aircraft operations. So the helicopter world is much more used to this dual use operation. And therefore what you see is it's much easier to build a civil product which is almost equal to the end product state registered or military registered. For us, for them also, it's much more comfortable. When we sign a TC, you see that we cover 
basically of the aircraft. So the remaining 10% have to be covered by a, a specific arrangement which will be a bit easier to manage in the real life. And then of course, the fourth scenario, no need to mention opt-in, listed aircraft becomes a full civil IASA certified aircraft and operated. So we are in the basic regulation and basically it's business as usual. But that's the extreme case. Today we have not so many and we have plenty of other cases which are like that. Alors, now I try to surprise you. It's just an extract of what people in IASA have done. And you can see very interesting uh, things. Bon, pyrotechnic devices, anti-missile system. We have been recently involved in many of them and many more. And in some instances, we can do almost 100% of the activity to the satisfaction of the customer and to the satisfaction, of course, of the military authorities, which find it much more comfortable to rely on what we do than to take part of our work and build on top their own compliance demonstration. So, surprisingly, when we did the competence inventory in certification and flight standard, we found some very interesting profile within our colleagues. <coughs> So, we spoke basically of design until now, John, and I come to your real uh, uh, background, to your past. This aircraft has to be operated, this aircraft has to be maintained, this aircraft has to be maintained airworthy. And here starts the problem. When we certify something, we certify it according to civil design assumptions, CS25, CS27, 29, whatsoever. We have a flat envelope which is governed by law. So we cannot go outside of it, and so forth. And the all certification assumptions are derived from our long history with CSEs and with the JARs, the FARs, and so forth. We certify it, and then we hand over to the military authority and operator. And of course, you know very well that military operations Slightly different. Sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> are not always predictable for a civil authority, very predictable for a military authority, but very frequently they are going beyond what we have certified. A typical case, you will send the next one, the flat envelope. And that leads me to this. It's a real case uh, example. We have certified an aircraft to CS25 to CS29 with a given flight envelope, G loads, uh, operating speed, and so forth. And in real life operation or training, they may be exceeded. If you exceed our civil loads, or if you go out of the flight envelope civil, it is obvious that our certification assumptions are invalidated. Mm -hmm. And you see the problem, John. So that's quite uh, difficult. And that's where we have to make sure that when an aircraft is civil certified, military or state operated, we have a robust system to maintain the fleet airworthy through a set of measures which may be civil or military or a mix of the two. We should normally issue an airworthiness directive, but are we able to issue the airworthiness directive? When the aircraft is operated outside of our legal framework, many people challenge us. You should not issue an AD because it's not your business. Bon, uh, one could say yes, one lawyer will say yes, one lawyer will say maybe, another one will say no. So we have to find our way through this uh, unclear situation. And in fact, the only way to do it is to have the right agreement with the operators and the military airworthiness authorities. Again, here, we are lacking the ICAO environment, we are lacking the single legal framework. So we need to talk to each and every individual to make sure that any occurrence is identified and uh, treated properly. And you see now the link to the DOA, military or civil. I spoke about occurrence on purpose. Occurrence means you have to identify unsafe condition, potential. And if you identify a potential unsafe condition, you have to report it. And we have to take corrective action. So what we try to do is to follow this kind of system into a very fragmented environment, which makes life not always very easy, but to make sure that we are able to understand really the occurrences with the DOA, and that we can recommend, that's the problem, we can recommend to the military authorities to issue an AD. We can issue an AD for the purpose of a civil definition, but then it has to be taken over by the military airworthiness authority to make sure that the complete aircraft will be taken care of. Quite, quite challenging. It's, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's like a huge col collaboration yeah. picture, isn't it? Alors, I don't, I don't dare, but I will, in fact, hein, uh, to show you the next slide, which shows the complexity of the issue. Oops, sorry. 
I went too far. That's, and it is a simplified chart I've chosen here for the first workshop I was nice to you. But in fact, it's even a bit more complicated. You see here all of the potential communication, not potential, all of the necessary communication to ensure that an occurrence will be first identified, then reported, then analyzed by the DOA, the two DOA, military and civil, reported and back to us to propose an action for an AD or not. So you see that this kind of uh, communication loop uh, is prone to over communication or miscommunication. And our duty with the three parties that we say here, so the three parties are the military authorities, the operator of course, the TC holder, DOA civil, DOA military, and us have to work really hand to hand. And I have to say, today we have developed a good relation with military awareness authorities, but it is challenging to have the same, and I'm sure you know what I will say, John, to have the same reporting culture. We do not need to know where an occurrence happened. We don't need to know whether it was in Africa or wherever, no. We need to know, I have a structural damage, this side, this shape, etc. I propose the repair solution to maintain the aircraft airworthy. Please certify it, Mr. Yaza. That's all. But even this form of reporting for the operator is a mindset of trust. And I think this is where the biggest problem comes in. Having been responsible for the reporting system in, in a military con uh, context, in not just Air Force, but Army and Navy as well, is, is at the operator level, it's that challenge of, you know, is, is there's the reporting of the operational safety element to the military system. Exactly. But it's useful, particularly, that you know, people working in the military context, even at the operational sense, are also aware that there are people here at IASA who need not the, the operational context like that, no. but it's the... Yeah, it's, it's what's happening technically with the aircraft that enables our experts to make those decisions. I think that's the key fundamental. Uh, a, a, a typical example, which is both civil and military, uh, icing. Mm, exactly. Severe icing. You have a problem. I don't need to know whether it was in training, in uh, commercial air transport or military operation. I simply need to know on this kind of aircraft, this altitude, which might be an issue, by the way, but even the altitude, we may find a way. We need to know that we have this occurrence which needs to be under full stop. So the way to anonymize the reporting and to let us know more easily is really a matter of mindset to make sure that people will trust our system. Because without trust, we can build whatever we want, it will not work. And today we see the trust uh, really... Uh, and I think that's you know, the, the work that, that yourself, Donny, and the others in the military coordination activity have done to build those uh, relationships and, and kind of have those positive discussions. I remember uh, 15 years ago a similar situation with reporting of a generator failure and there was lots of discussion in the occurrence report yep. about where the aircraft was and what it was doing. But once you kind of strip that away... Actually, there's lots of vital information yeah. that we need. For those who do not know, uh, John worked before on occurrence reporting. You may guess from his yeah. uh, speech, he, he was uh, very, very good at occurrence reporting. And, and yes, you see this culture, and uh, it, is, uh, it is really a fascinating exercise to, to build this relation between many awareness authorities, military and us, and to identify a simple process on how to best communicate without infringing any uh, restriction, be it national or whatever. And today, slowly, it's going through. And also, I have to be honest, for our expert, it's not easy always to understand the, the complexity or the additional dimension for, from the military operations. But slowly, it's going through. And what we see through various programs, helicopter in particular, even the 400 m which is uh, highly uh, visible on the political arena, for us, is a way really to it's a team building exercise. It is work under construction, but for us, we think this is the way to work together. Of course, we need to simplify to reduce as many arrows as possible to make sure that an occurrence is identified, reported to who needs to know, treated, analyzed, and when necessary, reported to us as reportable occurrence. If we can do so, and I think we are there. Yeah, yeah I can think of a number of examples yep. where th that reporting channel, particularly the role of, of the, the, the DOA in informing us, make sure that you know, input from the military community exactly. that's impacted the civil world, and similarly the other way around. And, and interestingly, there's a question that's had quite a few uh, votes there about, uh, uh, I know, 
particularly in some communities, safety management systems are, are kind of a new thing, and we got a question about the difference between the processes of occurrence reporting and safety management, and it's perhaps useful to, uh, uh, to mention that you know, occurrence reporting is one of the intelligence data sources yep. that you have within your safety management system. So they're not two different systems. Uh, occurrence reporting is a, a part of your safety management system. Very good reply. Thank you, John. You do my job. Thanks a lot. It's the area I really understand. Alors, I, I would add just one point to be a bit, uh, to be to remain serious. Sorry, Excellent. we were serious. Sorry, uh, it is under Part 21, so it is a mandatory obligation uh, on the DOA and the operators to to make sure that any reportable occurrence is reported. So it's just as you said, one element of the big picture. But for the purpose of airworthiness management, it is an obligation under Part 21 for the DOAs to uh, treat. Uh, occurrence and to have an occurrence reporting system in place to satisfy our Part 21 obligations. Well, we could speak for hours, but maybe you have some more questions, uh, John? I'm just looking at perhaps I'll go, to, I'll go particularly to the most recent questions so that I can see the ones we've had specifically on this. So um, there's one here. Is it envisaged that in the future a non-TCH civil DOA could do a repair design and minor changes on the civil part of a military aircraft services. So uh, say again? <laughs> so, a non-civil? So where you have a non-type a non stiff cold, a civil DOA, doing a repair design and minor changes on a civil part fitted to a military aircraft. I guess this is starting to mix but civil components, but it's within the scope of the military DOA, isn't it? But so? You have two ways to see, to see it. I think there is no definite answer for today. We can take the question mm -hmm. and come back later, but my, I speak under your control, Marcus, as former DOA, or maybe Julian is still there, but uh, I would say yes, as long as it is within the scope and the frame of the civil DOA. Mm, yeah. For me, that's the ground rule. Yeah, exactly. If it is within the civil environment, yes. If it is outside the civil environment, then, uh, that's a different story. Uh, and actually, there's a, a, another question about then, in terms of the collaboration, is how much are we collaborating then with military authorities out who are operating European products, but outside uh, the EU in terms of the geographic region? Alors, that's a very good question. Uh, in fact, we apply, I will keep it simple, so sorry, it's a bit uh, simplified. We apply a bit the same approach as how to work uh, with foreign countries, foreign operators, with which country we have no bilateral. That means we have a country where an Airbus or an ATR or a small airplane has been sold. We have no bilateral agreement with this country. So we have a problem here. We cannot rely on each other's system. Well, we have ICAO overarching uh, environment, so it helps. But still, we have no direct agreement with this given country. So we may have an issue to make sure that this aircraft is operated and maintained properly. So what do we do? Again, here, we rely on the DOA. Again, back, back to basic, it's quite simple. We rely on the TC holder to discharge their own responsibilities and to have the right communication tools and reporting tools in place to ensure that what happens in country X, Y, Z is reported to them. When you recommend, now back to this slide here, mm -hmm. when we recommend something as an AED, we apply the same philosophy. We notify EU uh, member states whom we know, and then we inform foreign countries, as we do for any other directive, mm -hmm. we notify a foreign authority that we have issued an AED, on the, of our recommend sorry, to issue an AED on this product, and then it is up to them to make it legal in their, in their legal system. That makes sense. That's a, that was a really good explanation. Uh, There's one question from, from Mark Perner from Abbas Helicopters. Does EASA have arrangements with EU military authorities in place, like BASAs with non-EU uh, authorities, or other cooperation agreements? And if yes, are they visible and accessible? And that's a very good question, thank you. Uh, there are a number of working agreements. Uh, De Nicole has been very active during his stay here to develop various agreements. Uh, we take the point whether it is accessible or not. I have to check, to be honest. Uh, it is not so clear, uh, but I, we take the point and we will clarify, uh, John, into the follow-up of the mm. workshop, whether they are accessible. But we have agreement with a number of countries in EU, for sure. The, the big ones are typical. Uh, and in terms of access to them, we will come back to the audience with a clear reply. And if yes, we will provide the necessary elements. 
I mean, so there's another question here from Sabina, actually. Um, how involved have EASA been in the, uh, in the military development of the EMARS, the European Military Airworthiness Regulations? How, how much do we interface with that? The reply is very simple. The agency has not been involved into their development, not at all. But we talk with them, we are part of their forum, we provide advice, experience, feedback on our system. And what we try to do with uh, a number of military authorities is to try to have the two systems to converge. EMARS are very close to, to our uh, uh, Part 21 and uh, CSEs. But they are not exactly one-to-one -one COVID, so we have to be careful. And also, uh, the issue is how to make sure that they will remain equal. So it is, for those who know the former times, the GAA, it is a bit the same as in the GAA. You had a reference, the jars. You could say IASA is the reference. Huh? We have a lot of regulatory material. And we have, for each country, national variants. And I will remember in my previous life, the comments, don't worry, Alain, we just have a small national variant here, but it's the same. Don't worry, it's the same. But this small national variant for a lawyer makes it totally different. That's the issue. Technically, it can make sense, but in terms of mutual recognition, this is a challenge. So to keep it uh, short, we have not direct involvement into the EMA. IDA is doing it. Uh, but we participate to their MAWA forum, yeah. maybe, you know, military yeah, was, In yeah. fact, funnily enough, Carl, who was on stage earlier yeah. when I first met, when I was in the military, and he was at EDA at a MAWA forum. Exactly. So, yeah, it's a small world, really. Yeah, and I participated to a number of MAWA forums. I have to say it was a nice experience mm. to share, really, yeah, uh, information forum. and to, to prepare the future. It's work under construction of the civil military uh, coordination is something which is uh, very interesting. Um, there's a question from Alexander. Is, in terms of, is there a do we have a requirement where states have to nominate effectively who their, their, their military airworthiness authority is? Is it, there's no formal process, it's just we collaborate with the ones that are there through the normal processes. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, the way yeah. it works, we it? have no, no say at all, it's a national mm. prerogative. They all have their own authorities, their own system, and uh, we cooperate with them as necessary. And actually that follows then, there's another question there from Duane. Um, in the civilian world, there's only one type certificate holder, but in the military world, in effect, there are, there are multiple type certificate holders because there are these multiple authorities and, and those kinds of things. Uh, you know, it, just, it just adds to the complexity of the collaboration. It's not something specifically within EASA's remit, though, is it? Uh, be careful, I would say, uh, John. Uh, the question is very interesting. There are multiple TC holders. Yes or no? There are multiple authorities. Yes. But indeed, it is true that at least one country here issues their own TC to themselves. Mm. So that's an additional complexity. You have normally, uh, let's take Airbus helicopter or Airbus Defense Space, we would issue a civil TC to them, and the, I don't know, the French and Italian authorities will issue TC, military, to them. Mm. In Germany, there is another TC issued through the state system. Yes. But in fact, we can work with it because yeah. at the end of the day, the DOA they will use relies still on the Airbus Defence Space or Airbus Helicopter. And, and, and this is where the role of the, DO, of the DOA is so kind of central yeah. to that project, that, that activity, as you've talked about in that picture that you showed earlier, yeah. so, so it shows so well. The only complexity here, the civil DOA and the military DOA have to be as combined, as converging as possible. Yeah. And then, then we're on the safe side. Fantastic. I think that was a re you know, some really good explanations there, and hopefully uh, the, the different questions people had were covered really well, and you know, I think that was a really interesting insight, perhaps, into a part of the ARSA activity that a lot of people might not get to see so often in detail, but actually that touches far more people than probably, I think, we many people imagine. Certainly, I know people in organisations who you know, are involved in both sides, civil and military, all of the time. So... Yeah, I think it was a really important discussion, and thanks very much for joining us, Alan. It's really great to have you uh, here. Thank you. So, Marcus, we move on to the next part of the agenda now, talking about, now about the technical topics, I think. Yes, we got a bunch of questions on the technical topics, whether it's about the antenna installations, composite materials, abstraction layer, or innovation. And I think you will start with the innovation block with, with Dominique Roland. 
Yeah, I think we're, uh, we're going to move on now to this technical topic block, and we've got these different questions, and yeah, we're going to run through all these different parts and, and all these interesting technical topics. No, to John. John. So, as we say, now we're going to focus on a number of these technical topics. There's, there's a lot of things to cover. Hopefully, you'll find it really, really interesting and engaging. You know, we've got lots of great questions and lots of really fantastic and experienced experts here to answer them for you. So, actually, we talk about you know, experts and the amount of experience we have in ER, so we couldn't start with anybody, perhaps, with more experience than our colleague, Dominique Rowland. Uh, Dominique, are you there? Hi, Dominique, can you hear us? I think you might be muted there. Yes, yes, I was muted, sorry. Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, thanks, uh, Dominique. So first we have a question from Oleg from ATL Europe who uh, asks about the SEPIAC platform. He, so he says, based on experience, EASA e uh, experts don't perhaps use it all of the time uh, or use it to pick up documents for review, but in such cases, they, he was worried that there wasn't traceability of the whole project progress. And then in terms of comments dealing with the project sent with various emails and that sometimes it might be easy to miss things. And he said at the moment he, f he kind of sees that there's no, not necessarily for him a clear view if documents have been picked up by the expert, uh, who the expert might be, uh, and then whether they reviewed the documents that have been uh, uh, uploaded to SEPIAC. Um, could you advise if SEPIAC is you know, the, the status of the project uh, and you know, if there's an intent to foresee all parties using that one project for all of the different activities for the data, the comments and all the other activities? Yes, uh, John, according to our records, SEPIAC is used massively some exceptions exist, but normally they are related to a short list of stakeholders who ask EASA to introduce a machine-to-machine -machine interface because of the very high volume of data exchange. And, and for that, uh, our IT team is actually uh, working on, on the feature. So to answer the question, we should use SEPIAC systematically, extensively, uh, CPIAC is progressing, improving on a constant basis. We have new functionalities, helping uh, the expert, the, the PCM, in their day-to-day -day task. So CPIAC is our collaborative platform. It helps us a lot, especially when we are working with uh, the support of uh, National Aviation Authority partners because they can have access and share the information, share the comments that we have to, 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 to make on documents submitted by the, by the applicant. So, yes, CPIAC should be used. If it is not used properly, well, the issue should be reported to, to the PCM first. And if there is no effect, to the, the, the section manager in, in charge of the product line. And after this meeting, uh, what I will do, uh, I will send a reminder to all mentioning this comment and that the people should make an effort to, to use the tool because it is helping a lot. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Dominique. And, and there's a follow-on question then from Oleg about um, challenges sometimes with communication with the ARSA, where they had a few cases where uh, the expert retired or, uh, and they weren't informed about that or that it took time then to allocate a new expert. Um, and sometimes you know, it was difficult then to, you know, there, there was a period where uh, EASA wasn't necessarily with a focal point in the project, and he asked, is it possible to improve communication, particularly, for example, if an expert's retired or uh, changed, or then the, and the applicant is in, informed more quickly and, and, and that kind of thing to help uh, sort of smooth the, com the communication? So the, the change of expert because of retirement or any, any other reason could be mobility, it is not linked to, to, to innovation. I, I'm smiling because I, I will retire soon, next year. 
And, and, and when we plan retirement, uh, we prepare a, a succession plan. And people, and it was explained this morning by, by other colleagues, and people are, are replaced. And we don't, normally, uh, we don't leave a, an empty position in, in the project. So this is the, the role of the, the PCM, the project certification manager, to inform the applicants when the team composition is changed. And this is the responsibility of the PCM to nominate a, a new uh, a new expert for, for the project. So again, if, if this happens, we, we need to, to, be, to be aware. So please escalate if needed, if the PCM is not reacting, if you see that you, you, you miss a, an expert because uh, the, the, the previous team member left the team, uh, escalate the issue, contact the, the, the section manager responsible for the product line, and the section manager will take action. But it's not linked to innovation. It is business as usual for us, of course. We have regular retirement or changes in the team, and we manage them. So if something happens, it's not normal, and we need to be aware. Fantastic. Thanks, Dominique. And there's a, a, another question now. Um, that, that re, that, that's kind of the, the core of, of the innovation discussion. So the question is, a new innovative uh, UAV weighing over a 1,000 kilos is under development by a DOA, uh, and the product certification process has commenced. It's progressing sort of slowly and is expected to be completed by 2024. So there's... There's, there's three specific questions, and maybe I'll ask them all and let you answer the three together. So the first one is, is there any guidance material from EASA to support such type of innovative products that are yet to achieve certification and support these kinds of innovative projects? Uh, then is there similarly any guidance material from EASA to support the production activities being considered by an AS 9100D organisation uh, supplier for prototype activities in support of that kind of products. And then finally, if there's no existing guidance from EASA, uh, can, they provide can we provide guidance on the factors, criteria, uh, requirements that should be considered to minimise any potential safety or quality risks during the certification and manufacturing process uh, and the use of any parts pending that certification process? Okay, many questions, but I believe here we are missing a point which was uh, clearly uh, presented uh, during the session this morning. That, of course, we talk about drones, uh, different kind of uh, animals here, drones weighing uh, 250 grams to drones weighing more than one ton, but it's not enough. The weight is not, is not always the element that will help to, to, to classify the, 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 or, or to decide the process that we will use for, 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 for managing the case. Um, and certification is not, and, and of course, is, is not always needed. And, and, and we explained this morning that we have uh, different categories, the certified drone, and we have then the specific category, and in the specific category, we have a, a, a number of, of, of different uh, subcategories, level, that we, 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 we call cell, cell level, cell one, two, three, four, five, six. And these cell level are, are, are the outcome of, of an assessment uh, uh, performed uh, in accordance with SORA. So it's, it's impossible to answer the question without knowing the cell level of, of, of the product we are talking about. Uh, we have tried to be proportionate and in order to manage innovation, to propose a, a, a simplified approach to support the development of, of, of drone in the specific category. It was mentioned this morning that we decided not to use part 21 light and in fact try to keep uh, our activity uh, in support of, of, of the authorization uh, which is granted by the national authority um, to propose an activity outside part 21 because as soon as we move into part 21 this would trigger uh, complexity uh, production approval for the production maintenance approval for the maintenance and so on so we propose a new service that we call design verification and, and this is a service to the NA, who is ultimately the National Aviation Authority responsible to deliver an authorization. So all that is explained uh, on our website. It's 
just Google EASA UAS, and then you will find a web page where you find a lot of links to different guidances explaining the, the, the different possibilities. So uh, I cannot go really much more into the detail because the, the information provided in the, in the question doesn't let me uh, determine uh, if we talk about a drone falling into the certified category or into the specific category. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That makes uh, sense. And then one final question for you, Dominique. Um, what, is the digi what is digital certification and how will it, it be used in future by EASA to support the certification process? Well, digital certification uh, is uh, behind the, 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 the name. You, you, you will find a, a, a lot of different initiatives. Uh, we, we are dealing with this uh, new initiative. We have processes in place. It was explained in the video that we call Innovation Partnership Contract that enable us to, 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 to enter into relation and work together with the applicant on very innovative concept. So we could talk about uh, uh, new uh, model-based development methodologies and associated demonstration uh, means. Uh, making use of advanced modeling, simulation, or other virtual reality tools uh, deemed to facilitate a, a reduction of lead time to certification and introduction to the market of, of new aviation product. It will also influence the approach to maintenance, for instance, by allowing an increased reliance on digital twins and predictive health monitoring tools when determining inspection intervals that could be customized to individual aircraft from a given type monitored in real time worldwide. So it's really uh, fascinating uh, what digital certification we, we, will uh, really allow us to do in the future. So the agency is preparing itself to this new era by following a number of e-research projects in clean aviation and through direct cooperation with industry through this uh, innovation partnership uh, contract. And it helps us also to, to, to plan ahead and, and to develop the, 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 the skills uh, and to prepare also the new regulatory uh, environment. So, of course, in parallel, uh, we know that this, uh, these changes will, will may, may trigger adaptation of our certification processes um, to include this uh, new uh, mean of compliance and new, new tools. And, and, of course, we need to be uh, prepared and ready in due time to support uh, the industry. Thanks for that, uh, that one, Dominique. Can you, you mentioned that there, I think there's a yeah, question the, from pre-application, perhaps, if you've got that. Yeah, Dominique, there's a question in Slido about the pre-application process you talked about in your presentation. And it's about the possible timeline for the implementation of this kind of process. Yes, it's another tool that uh, it's a very good transition because we were talking about an adaptation of our certification procedure, and this is what we do actually, working on new concepts, that these concepts are pre-application. Uh, if, you, if you come to us with a very uh, conventional project uh, uh, that we can certify using the existing uh, CS25 or CS23 requirements, well, uh, you can introduce uh, um, in, in your technical specification uh, easily, you can introduce easily the certification constraint and, and base uh, the, the design, the development of your product on known uh, certification requirements. So you have certainty because you, you know what you will have to uh, uh, certify. With innovation, it happens that you, you, you want to certify a new design for which the current certification specifications are not appropriate. Uh, we talk about electrical aircraft, hybrid, hydrogen, who knows what, and, 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 and we miss requirement. And so you are, as an applicant, uncomfortable because you say, look, if I start my design and if later on, after the certification process has started, the, the EAS has come with a special condition uh, that could impact uh, my design and ruin all the efforts that we have done so far. Uh, in, uh, in developing our product, uh, we, we will lose a lot of money. So you are, you are looking for so, some kind of certainty. So the idea is to approach EASA before applying for the TC and say, hey, EASA, I plan to apply for this new product, but I have something quite innovative, new, 
and I believe uh, I need your, 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 your input before so that uh, we can um, uh, get, some, or get uh, some kind of certainty uh, for the development of, of, of the design solution. So the pre-application could be uh, there to uh, organize discussion before uh, application uh, for an UTC or maybe even an STC. And so that we can uh, agree together on, on the special condition because normally we are using the special condition tool to uh, complement the existing requirement with uh, what is needed to support uh, the new innovative uh, feature of, of this new product. So, um, of course, it's a new concept, not yet in place, because we, we still have to work internally and refine uh, the solution. Uh, of course, we still have to go in, in, in detailed discussion with our legal department, but we have good hope that we can propose this uh, new service uh, sometime next year. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Dominique. And, uh... Uh, huge thanks for all your inputs on the innovation topic there. I think hopefully everybody found that really, really useful. Uh, and now, Marcus, I think you've got some questions now on uh, uh, Ferran on the uh, abstraction the layer, which abstraction is also layer. something yeah. quite innovative. Uh, and I would like to welcome Anse Nishal to answer the questions we received on this. Abstraction layer, it's a task force that was set up by EASA and FAA commonly to evaluate uh, other means of compliance and aviation standards. And we received uh, quite a number of, of questions on that. Uh, the first one, hi, Anne, is from Valer Hello, Valerio from Logic. Uh, at the end of the activities performed by the task force, will this lead to an update of the AMC 2152A, adding the additional standards identified uh, to this material? Uh, instead of Euro-K or RTCA documents that are currently recognized? And will this then be done by means of an NPA, for example? So, yes, indeed. So we are, we are looking at this question and uh, actually at the end of this uh, report that we, we have completed the abstraction layer report, at the end we issued three recommendations. And um, for, for the recommendation three, I think it's addressing the question. The recommendation three is about de defining a framework for recognition of alternate standards assessed using the abstraction layer and for its potential use in uh, aviation projects. So it's part of this uh, follow-up task uh, as part of recommendation three to assess the best format for recognizing these uh, alternate standards and also uh, to address uh, the potential gaps, if any, that would be found when assessing these standards. So we don't know yet actually where we will, um, let's say, uh, uh, put this recognition of alternate standard, if any, uh, but uh, it's part of this recommendation three. So we cannot really explain if we would update or not the current AMCs, but uh, it, uh, it could be as part also of uh, other AMCs uh, to recognize this standard. Thanks for the clarification, Anne. I think the topic as such uh, seems to be very interesting to industry because the next question was from Saban from Tuzas Engine Industries. Is it possible to join or contribute to this task force activities? And I think it's a common activity between authorities and industry already. Yes, indeed. So we have done the first part of the activity, which is drafting the abstraction layer. And we did that together with FAA. It's a joint activity that we were tasked by our senior management to do it. And we associated uh, industry members. Uh, the industry members uh, were nominated by ASD, Gamma, and AIA. And uh, the, the group was composed of uh, 18 uh, members in total, with 12 uh, EU or US industry members. So if um, there is a, a such request of uh, being a member from an industry, this uh, request should be addressed uh, to these recognized uh, industry bodies, uh, ASD, Gamma, or AIA. Okay, thanks for and that I update. So, for those colleagues who would be interested, I would recommend that you contact these advisory bodies or industry associations and then get involved in the activity. The last question on this topic was from Serhat from Under Electromechanical Systems. 
Is there a plan to have a comment response session for the work that industry uh, and authorities are briefed on this? And do you have a plan by when this would be done? Okay, I see. So, um, the first, is, I, I want to recap that the task force was a, a study uh, that was, uh, let's say, uh, on which we were issuing a, a report. But this is not at this stage any kind of a rulemaking task. So this uh, this study is uh, is ongoing with the further steps of three recommendations, but uh, we plan to to publish the material. But as part of the report, and a report normally doesn't go through a command phase, uh, it, 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 as I just said, it's not a, a rulemaking task, so we don't go through a, a formal commenting response phase. Um, nevertheless, would you have any comment when the report is published and available? Uh, we would, of course, welcome your comments and, uh, uh, and uh, see, uh, uh, let's say, the, how to, to evaluate and consider them in a, in a further step. The further step after, if we ever come into, if ever the, we come to, a, a, let's say, a kind of a recognition of alternate standard in, a, in an AMC, then we would go for a, for a kind of, a, let's say, a normal rulemaking task if, if, if this goes forward. But not at this stage for the report, so no command phase at this stage. Okay, thanks a lot on, on this topic. And John, I think we have a few other topics on the antenna installation or the uh, composite materials that you're going to discuss with the colleagues. We are. So the next one we're going to move on to is to talk about the antenna changes with uh, our colleague Wolfgang uh, Hoffman. Wolfgang, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, good that you could join us. So for the first question from uh, Alexandra from uh, ECM, we have in reference to the third memo on antenna installation, he says, uh, it's noted that for small antenna installations, that specifications would also apply, these specifications would also apply, but the sub substantiation needed to demonstrate compliance with the various specifications may be less rigorous. Can you provide some examples to clarify the terms less rigorous? Yes, uh, so thank you very much for this question, Alexander. So the terminology less rigorous is possibly not the right term, so I have to say here. Um, when we are talking about the extent of efforts to show compliance for small antennas, it is meant that in some cases an easier showing of compliance is possible. And when we are talking about those small antennas, so we are talking about mainly of the footprint of those antennas they are doing on the um, aircraft structure, that means on the skin structure of the fuselage, uh, fuselage mainly. And um, so the small antennas are, well, uh, with a footprint of, um, of one frame bay, that means an area between two stringers, adjacent stringers and two adjacent uh, frames. And uh, let me take three examples for that. Um, the first one is an antenna doubler for small antennas could be proposed by similarity of uh, structural repair manual repair doublers. So that means um, this is a more easy way to show compliance because there are already some um, certified repair standard doublers uh, given by the TCH and the repair documentation. So, and of course, what you have to do there, uh, these doublers are only um, certified for, for the uh, existing skin loads, yeah? Uh, what you also have to do on top of this, of course, is that you uh, have to introduce the antenna loads um, additionally to the flag loads uh, on the uh, skin panel or the tabla. So, this is one more easy way to show compliance, making a similarity approach uh, with existing uh, repair doublers. Uh, second example is uh, for small antennas. For example, we don't have only the footprint. We may have also the, well, the build-up. So that means you may have, for example, short blade antennas protruding a few centimeters out of the fuselage. You may have large blade antennas. Uh, going up to 30 centimeters out of the fuselage, yeah? and then depending on um, on the location, if it's more aft in uh, the fuselage, so you have to make an assessment um, 
uh, what is going on with the vibration buffeting there. For the short um, blade antennas, I think it's not that much of an issue. Um, so if it's mounted in the very aft of your fuselage uh, and it's not protruding that much out of the boundary layer, so you could uh, say that vibration and buffeting is uh, not that much of an issue. And um, also the same for, for flight testing loads, so that there is less um, effort to be done for flight testing. On the other hand, if you have uh, from the footprint uh, the other small antenna protruding very much out of the uh, boundary layer, that means a large blade antenna, you may have to do something else, uh, for example, um, computational fluid dynamics calculation uh, for vibration buffeting to support this, uh, because that may have an uh, issue, making issue. It's protruding that much out of the boundary layer that you have vibration and buffeting as an effect there, where you would have to do something on this. Um, example number three is um, the very nice and easy antennas, the GPS antennas. So they are. Um, well, in the size of a kind of cigarette box, not that much, so two up to five centimeters high. Uh, also, the typical footprint for a small antenna, one frame bay. And those ones are very uncritical from our experience. And this is a good example where you really don't have to do CFD calculation, that means computational fluid dynamics. And um, you can rely from the footprint also as uh, explain for the uh, example one and two on the standard repair manual and the repair doublers giving there with the similarity uh, approach. And uh, also the influence on the aerodynamics uh, wouldn't be very high. The more you um, locate the antenna in the after the fuselage, the wider is the boundary layer and no effect will be done there. So this is um, just uh, the three examples to show there you have a more easy way to show compliance for the and, uh, small antenna installations. Yeah, that's all for the antennas. Fantastic. Thanks very much, uh, Wolfgang. And there's one more question then on aging aircraft structures, uh, yes. where it says uh, TCH were tasked to define FCBS. Uh, where can the definitions for these be found? Yeah, OK, that was a thing from Jörg uh, from uh, Growing. Uh, yeah, thanks for this question as well. It's a very easy one. So uh, the TCH, the TC holder, is obliged to uh, uh, to make a uh, fatigue residual baseline structures list uh, and to make it available to the operators and persons who require to who are required to comply with the um, 26.330 and the 26.370 requirements of the Part 26. So. Uh, the list um, are typical provided uh, upon request um, or published in, in the TCH documentation, such as uh, the structural repair manual. So don't worry about this. You cannot walk uh, past it. So in case of doubt, you just uh, pick up the phone and call the TCH, and they will have to uh, provide you the list of this FCBS. Fantastic. Thanks for that uh, comment then, Wolfgang. Uh, that was really useful and yeah, hopefully that explains uh, that situation more. Um, okay. Thanks very much for your answers there. And we, we've got, we're, um, uh, we're going to move on to the subject of composite materials. And then we, if we come to the question from Gregory, for Gregory after that. Um, so we've got one question, uh, Simon, for you. Uh, Simon, wait, are you there, Simon? Yeah. Hello. Hi, good that you could join us, fantastic. So the question we have is uh, uh, from Ian again from the Independent Aircraft Modifier Allowance, uh, Alliance who asks, says, on several occasions it's difficult in substantiation uh, for smaller organisations is mentioned as the engineering properties are considered IP while for metallic material it's in the public domain. Uh, it was outlined, for example, that F and DT uh, analysis are a large threat to small organisations because of the limited availability of data. So while EASA and the FAA maintain a level playing field for regulators by turning FAA, the FAA AC of 50 plus pages uh, into an SAE standard, uh, 
that they, li they would like us to outline that we aim to discuss a transparent approach between all stakeholders to grant access for airlines and their modifiers to related data. Um, this of course includes accepting the intellectual property of the OEM and is mainly aimed to establish a transparent process that ensures a level playing field and an open market. And AYAMA, his organisation, has developed a position paper on this issue of engineering data access that he would like to share with authority representatives. Um, would they, IASA be interested in a review uh, of this? Thank you. It's an interesting question. It captures a number of considerations at the moment. At the higher level, it's a good example of the changing balance between the regulators and industry in terms of generation of guidance material as we move towards performance-based regulation. Um, the second more specific material aspect is, uh, well, firstly, you know, we don't certify materials, but we accept them as part of a project. But an important element of that can be the use of shared databases. So that's important to this question, I think. Um, initially, this question is also really a commercial question because it's about what data can be shared. Once the stakeholders can agree on what that data is, then it's appropriate for the regulators to be involved and we need to understand what the gap is. And um, in that sense, yes, we, yes, Yasa would definitely be interested in such a paper, particularly presented in a coordinated and harmonised way. Um, but a real reminder of needs to be put in place here. The challenges will be the need to demonstrate equivalence because the engineering properties are dependent upon the processes. So how, how is one, one of the IAM a member is going to be able to do that. So that would be part of the process that I see needs to be addressed. And furthermore, the scope for that acceptance by the regulators will be a function of the application criticality. Um, and again, the reference to the 50 pages, that's referring to the composites modification uh, draft AC, which is now being transferred um, across as a task to the uh, Commercial Aircraft Composite Repair Committee and is a good example for composites. But in fact, you can read across a lot of that to some of the other advanced materials and processes such as additive manufacturing. So um, yeah, that, that's a, it was a nice question because it's, it's bridge is dealing with a number of issues. So, or the answer could simply be yes. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Simon. You definitely win the prize for the best headphones of the day. I've become a real connoisseur of <laughs> headphones over the, uh, you know, all these, all these months of Zoom calls. So, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, thanks for that question. Ga gaming. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. So, thanks for that reply. And perhaps this is a great time uh, to now go to the, uh, we're going to have a follow-up question for, for Gregory Lieve on uh, the international that we got from uh, Gilles Fontaine from Airbus. Uh, Gregory, are you there? Yes. Hi, thanks for coming back uh, and joining us again. So uh, the question that Gilles asks is, the DOA is an asset for both the approved, organi for both the approved organizations and EASA. Uh, keeping in mind recent events, putting at stake other delegate, the other delegation system, is EASA considering to further promote the DOA system at international level? And then how could the EU industry support that? Uh, thanks, Gilles, for, for the question. Um, so uh, EASA, as you probably know, um, has a number of tools to, to present and promote our system uh, worldwide. Uh, overall, our international footprint has continuously increased since we were established back in 2003. Uh, and, and in particular, one of the tools that we have is, is a growing network of external representatives. So, so that's the first tool which we regularly use to present and promote uh, our system. We are also present in the international fora such as ICAO. Uh, and, and last but not least, coming to my mind, uh, is the uh, program we have for technical assistance projects. And that's uh, yet another opportunity where we present our system to foreign partners. Uh, and by the way, to answer the second part of the question, uh, in some of these projects, industry is, uh, is represented. I would just add two, two remarks to, to maybe moderate a little bit uh, uh, the enthusiasm of, of this first part of the answer. Um, in, in particular, re regarding DOA, there were cases in the past where, paradoxically, we were a bit victims of our success. Uh, and some international partners liked a lot our DOA concept, 
were trained and supported in introducing it in their uh, own regulatory framework. And later on, they started to ask our own EU DOA to apply for a, a duplicate local DOA, uh, and this created difficulties. So sometimes we have to be a bit careful when we export our concepts to make sure that we do so in a controlled manner and, there's, and that there is a mutual recognition so, so that our EU DOA is found as a good enough tool to demonstrate the design capability by international partners, which it is, by the way, for instance, for all BASA partners. Um, just another side remark, maybe to, to, to conclude on this question. Uh, sometimes um, the EU develops or invents concepts which are first the subject of a relative rejection worldwide, and later on the idea matures and, and finds you know, its, its own ways into our partners' setup. And, and a good example recently was with the OSD, the Operational Suitability Data. That's another concept which was created in Europe. Um, promoting it was a bit of a challenge when it was um, invented, um, and we did not too aggressively promote it. We just made sure it was accepted. And, and, and in fact, the idea matured, and recently one of our major partners approached us and said, well, you know what? In view of certain developments, we think this is a very bright idea you had, and we want to introduce it in our own uh, legal framework. Uh, and now we, we restart the support with that partner. So, so just to, to, to um, highlight the fact that being too aggressive in promoting our system may be counterproductive in, in some cases. Sometimes it's just good to explain what we are doing, explain why we are doing so, explain the consistency of our system, and, and let our partners mature their reflection. Uh, and, and when the ideas are good, very often they will come back to us sooner or later to, uh, to seek our support to, um, to develop something similar in their own uh, regulatory system. So I, I hope this answers uh, Gilles' question. Fantastic. Thanks for coming back and answering that question so comprehensively, Gregory. Um, so we, uh, we, we haven't had so many questions on the environment at this stage. So uh, perhaps, Marcus, you want to address some more questions on cabin changes? No. No. We, in fact, we didn't get any questions on those either. So. No. So... Uh, is it worth, I don't know if it's possible to get, uh, we were waiting to see if we could get Robert back. Um, I don't know if I he's... I don't know, Rob, whether he, he's back or not. Yes, we have him back I'm on here. the line, so oh. yeah, perhaps we can come back to those questions. And I know there's some questions perhaps on the Slido that, that we could come back to. Okay, Rob, good to have you back. Uh, one question was from Stefan from Airbus again. Very active question here. Uh, for certain major changes, for obtaining the first time the privilege we should have a reference change to propose as part of the package for the application. Um, if the reference change is meeting all the AMC condition, is it acceptable to use and declare the change as reference after it is uh, EASA's initial approval? So the initial approval is done the, under the normal project process and you just declare it afterwards, this will be my reference project for the third major change in the future? Yes, it's, a, it's an interesting question and yes, we do allow this. So th th this is definitely a possibility. Uh, what the applicant uh, really needs to carefully check is that all the AMC conditions indeed are met, as uh, Stefan is, uh, is writing. We do have the experience that if you start to use older projects, and uh, let's say a project maybe three years old, that the data generated at that time may not completely support uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the obtaining the privilege or extending the privilege. So do be careful with that. Um, we prefer to do the reference project as a project within in EASA where everybody knows, okay, it's going to be used uh, in support of uh, the application of, uh, of a, for instance, a major change privilege but uh, it doesn't uh, mean that it can be excluded to use an older project. Thanks, Ian. From Ian Devine from the Independent Aircraft Modifier Alliance, we got another question uh, related to the privileges. Um, the question is more or less um, appreciating the utilization of the LOI principle uh, as such. Can the wider DO, the design organization community with ongoing applications expect acceptance of approval certain STCs under their own privileges? As some delays are experienced, but I think it's a case-by-case -case assessment for each organization independently. 
Yeah, it definitely is. Um, in such a case, I would just simply contact your DOA team leader, uh, get grips on the process and, and, and the status within the ASA. If you have an ongoing application for new privileges, please discuss with your DOA team leader. Uh, we do see that uh, sometimes uh, the progress is slow because of the rigor we are, we, are, we are employing in this process, and we need to really carefully check that all the uh, prerequisites are fulfilled. Uh, but yeah, uh, the main message is please contact your DOA team leader to, to know exactly what the status is. Thanks for that clarification. Then one question from Nazan from Tower Certification Engineering. In the scope of LOI, if a DOA holder gains the privilege to approve certain STCs, do they still have to apply for a other for those STCs? So clearly no. Uh, there's no need when, when a project is done under privilege, when we've extended your DOA privileges to do, for instance, an STC under privilege, then there's no need to apply for, for, for that STC. Um, you, you do comment that, that I talk about zero LOI in my, uh, my, my presentation, and really what is meant with that is really we have no involvement whatsoever in such cases, so not even an application. Okay, then one more question from Solutions for Aviation. Actually, several questions, again, about the new STC privileges. And that's an, a, a fair question. The internal experience on these approvals, that we have it homogeneous applied throughout by all DOA team leaders, the other stuff involved. Um, maybe you can say a little bit about that and also the training that was provided. Yes, indeed. So, so very good question. And uh, yes, we are aware of that. And um, we need to harmonize our approach. And this is what we're doing today. And uh, we're starting to build up the experience with these type of approvals. And uh, I myself uh, am, am explaining them to, to our DOA team leader communities at various occasions. Uh, we are making sure that uh, through the application of internal policy, but also review, uh, that the approaches are consistent. And uh, yes, as you already mentioned, Marcus, uh, we've definitely also given training on this topic uh, to, to all the OIT leaders. One other aspect is the timeline that you expect. How long does it take a DOA to obtain the privilege um, for this significant change to the design organization? It's really difficult to say. It really depends on the type of project, uh, the maturity of the procedures you have already developed as a DOA, uh, whether you have good reference projects, uh, whether you intend to apply with the reference project in the future, then obviously that is going to add some time. So it's very difficult to say. Um, usually uh, we, can, we can match the speed of the organization in doing our reviews and providing feedback uh, to, to work towards the approval. Thanks. And the last element, I think, which is also interesting to most of the industry, how specific or limited are the privileges granted? Do you really are stuck to the example that you provided, or can you have a kind of flexibility? Well, obviously, not one single project is the same. So we try to govern this through all of the prerequisites that are explained in the EMC. Now, I'm not going to read out loud the EMC in, in this moment, so I really encourage you to, to review very carefully EMC number one to the new privileges, and um, where it says the similarity of the changes is to be seen in terms of the design, the installation, the operational uh, characteristics, and the repetitiveness has to be seen in the sense of compliance demonstration. So, and then later on in this AMC, it goes into these topics in, in quite some detail, explaining exactly uh, where we see similarity and, uh, and where we see repetitiveness of the process. Um, we do apply at the moment these criteria that are published in the, uh, in the AMC uh, very strictly. So, so this should, should give you a good idea about where the variation can be. Okay, thanks a lot, Rob, for these good answers on the topics. And I think that yeah, brings us welcome. to the end of this workshop. We run a little bit over time, but I think it was worth to try and address as many questions as possible. I thank John and all the colleagues involved uh, for this very smooth uh, handling of the workshop. Due to COVID-19, it was a bit uh, different environment uh, 
and for sure all of you normally attending the DOE workshops, you didn't have the chance to do the normal networking that is one of the important elements. And we hope that in the future, next year, uh, we will be able to run this workshop in the normal physical way mm. and can welcome you all back here uh, in Cologne. Uh, you will receive shortly a questionnaire or query to assess uh, the event because we would like to know what to do better, what to do differently to improve things for the future. And I hope uh, that we all and you all found it useful, to, uh, the material you provided. We will try to answer uh, some of the Slido questions we still were not able to address yet uh, and provide you the feedback uh, via our website. And as John mentioned earlier, uh, we will also take this into account in our improvement of how to address things in a, in a different way. Um, for me, all I have to say is thank you very much for your interest and your attention. Stay safe, have a happy Christmas time and all the best to you and see you in the future. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.